Right, thanks very much. I'd like to say thanks to Estelle for standing in at, uh, at short notice and just to explain that Laurie Penny has cancelled a whole bunch of her speaking engagements after the incident that happened with uh, Starkey, David Starkey. Do people know? Do people see how she was treated? I think it was an absolute disgrace. She was on a panel with Starkey, who is a bigot and a disgusting right-wing historian, um, who was allowed by the person running it to completely um, have a go at her, standing over her like this, telling her you know, what a dreadful woman she was because she had the audacity to call him a bigot and a racist because of some of the things that he was saying about the men in Rochdale and uh, she was absolutely right and he was wrong and I think let's send her a bit of a solidarity message from this meeting that we're sorry she can't be with us but in a way the story itself tells you a little bit of what we're up against doesn't it right well let's start on more cheery things the struggles that we've seen over the last year 18 months not just in Britain but across the world have seen women at the forefront, haven't they? I mean, that's what's been unique about some of these struggles coming through. And I think some of them have been heroic struggles. I mean, you know, it's brilliant, this uh, Marxism, to hear some of the Egyptian revolutionaries talking about the struggles they've been part of. And to me, one of my um, heroes of the revolution is a woman called Samira Ibrahim. Some people may be familiar with her. She is the woman who, um, one of the women who were taken by the military and strip searched and had so-called virginity tests, which is really another word for sexual assault by the military, in order to prove they weren't virgins because they said if they weren't virgins, it shows they were loose women and they weren't like your daughter or your sister because they were sleeping the night in Tahrir Square as part of the revolution and they wanted to try to crush these women and make them not feel like they could be part of um, the demonstrations anymore and to try to separate them from the mainstream to make out like these are um, uh, these are other women and she went public she comes from a conservative town and a, in a, and a conservative family it was incredibly courageous to come out and say what had happened to her because that alone could have been very difficult for her but she has had immense solidarity and it's women like that who have refused to let the ruling elites and the um, and the counter revolution pushed them back. That I think have been uh, have been tremendous. People may also remember the woman that became known as, unfortunately, the blue brow woman, but a woman who was actually physically assaulted. That was caught on YouTube, caught on video by the military in one of the demonstrations, and they kicked her and uh, and pulled off her uh, pulled off her um, um, her veil. And that that situation, what happened with her? Um, it, it, again, it was meant to, to, to make women fear coming out in the streets in case they would face both the physical um, assault and the humiliation of being treated in this way. What happened after that? The biggest demonstration seen in Cairo by women since 1919. So women saying, we refuse to take the fear. We refuse to be pushed back by the military and by the counter-revolution. And the similar in Yemen, when Saleh uh, came out and said, it's not Islamic for women to march. More women than ever marched after he made that speech. And now Saleh is history. And actually, the people are still fighting for to, to bring to, to push their revolution to the end. And so we've always said as socialists that every struggle when it comes forward, every struggle against capitalism, against oppression, um, against imperialism, will have women, if it's to be a genuine struggle, will have women at the fore, will have the oppressed at the fore, and being proved time and time again. And I think what you see today is capitalism in this fu is fundamental crisis that's carrying on for years and uh, a situation where it cannot deliver the basic needs for more than half of humanity. And in many societies across the globe, women are at the bottom of the pile, and therefore the need for liberation, the need for a struggle is so clear. But today is really, I think, going to be a lot about the debates for us today in Britain. And I think there's many new debates about uh, women's liberation, but um, there's many that we actually battles we thought we'd long won. One of them is abortion that's come to the forefront in recent months, hasn't it? Because not only have you got the Tories and Nadine Doris, well, she is a Tory, but you know she's the one leading the way with encouragement from the backs, you know, um, behind her from Cameron and the other Tories for, to attack abortion rights in Britain. They don't like the idea that there's any abortion rights. There's not enough abortion rights, in my opinion. They, it needs to be, it shouldn't be two doctors signing for it. It should be available everywhere on the NHS and not depending on your postcode. But actually, they want to cut it back. And actually, not only the Tories, this has opened the door for some of the most 
bigoted and active and militant anti-abortion people, if people saw those 40 days, people who picketed out um, B-pass clinics, pregnancy advisory clinics in the lead up to Easter and holding up horrible images and everything else to frighten women and deter women from going in to have access to abortion. It's absolutely appalling development which really reflects what's going on in America but it shows what can happen here if the government sort of let it allow to be in the mainstream. They'd like to try and pretend that abortion is too liberal, that there's too many abortions, that it's too easy for women. Women have them for frivolous reasons and all of this is playing into it, actually encouraging some of the most bigoted um, um, people to, to feel that they can, uh, they can come forward. And uh, people should watch that there is shortly going to be an announcement from a government committee about changes in the counselling um, services that women who seek abortions will be given. If you remember, it was voted down in Parliament, the change, but actually the Tories have allowed it to go into a committee where they might change it behind our backs without a vote. And this could mean that organisations that are anti-abortion um, could end up providing... Uh, counselling uh, for women who are seeking abortion and with public money because they say that abortion clinics have got some sort of an incentive to encourage women to have an abortion because supposedly they make money out of it. They don't make money, they're charities, they're non-profit making. But this is, the, this is the, uh, the thing that's going through. So if this comes through with a bad change, we will have to mobilise everywhere about it and not let, them, not let them get away with it. So there's a battle we thought we'd won that we're having to re-win and re-win. But there's also battles we knew we hadn't. Childcare, free childcare, uh, equal pay, equal pay, the gap between men and women has, has come smaller, but it's still very much there. But I think what's interesting is some arguments we've, that are familiar but are taking place in a, in a different context. So, you know, a generation, you know, there's, there's a big spread in age in this room tonight. And if you think the different expectations the young women in this room have to some of the older women in the room are fundamentally different, aren't they? For younger women today, they expect to be financially independent. They expect to work after having children. They expect not to face blatant discrimination um, in their life. They expect to have children regardless of whether they're married or not and expect to be able to get an abortion if they want one. And a whole number of other gains that we made, we fought for and we got those gains. We're never given to us. Nothing, the vote or anything that women have won have always been won with a struggle, extracted, if you like, from the ruling class, not something they've ever given away. But these are genuine gains that actually free, uh, generations have been able to take advantage of. But I think that if we're going to have any genuine discussion about where we are, we have to talk about the new context, context we're in. Because, you see, sexism today is sexism. I, you, you always say it's like sexism with a twist. It's sexism in a world where actually women have greater expectations of equality and liberation, but actually so it's turned in a different way. And I think the question is, you know, I was telling Estelle that I was at college here um, many, many decades ago, and I remember the uh, rugby club were a complete sexist bunch that used to have strip nights, and we used to protest about them, spray paint the walls and everything else. Now, is that the same? Protesting against the rugby club here at UCL in the late 1970s, is that the same as protesting about, say, a club night um, you know, run with some sort of sexist uh, flyers in a, in a student union, perhaps often run by women and men. See, it's the same but different, isn't it? It's not quite the same thing. It needs different arguments. And for instance, you know, um, nude calendars and page threes and stuff. I mean, Estelle and I shared a platform in Portsmouth uh, in a debate with the athletics club about trying to get rid of their nude calendar. Now, what was interesting was we weren't, there was women on both sides of the debate. There was women from the athletics club saying it's empowering you know, to have this new calendar. And actually, the men do it too. But hang on, you know, there's women's oppression. It is different how women's bodies are treated in, in the system. And actually saying, oh, but there's all different bodies. You know, it's not just about the sexy bodies you get in porn. I mean, well, this is the athletics club. You know, they weren't all different bodies for a start. But, you know, th but that sense of it is a different argument that you have to take on. And the idea that empowering can be used near anything that is a nude calendar, to me, shows there's things that you have to take on. So it's a, it's a sexism that's the same, but actually in a, different, in, a different, uh, in a different context. And I think precisely because we've won so many battles to, to, to be recognised as autonomous sexual beings, to have our own desires and, and, uh, and to, uh, for those to be recognised and to have the ability to control our fertility so that sex can be for fun and not just for procreation, those are big gains, that that can be turned against us in the idea of... Um, of, uh, uh, you know, if you're so liberated, then actually any sexism now is sort of irony. It's just a laugh. Don't take it seriously, isn't it? I mean, so some of it can be so ridiculous, you know, well, if you don't cry, you have to laugh. For instance, if people heard, um, I've read it out once before at a meeting, the, the label inside a pair of jeans, the washing label. Have you heard this one? Inside it says, machine wash warm, inside out with light colours, use only non-chlorine bleach, tumble dry medium, medium hot iron, do not iron print, or give it to your woman. It's her job. 
Now that's a real life label. Now hey, it's only a bit of fun, you know, because we don't mean that. But it's not really funny, is it? Nobody's laughing in the room. What's more serious, I think, um, are other things that come that we're told are... Um, oh, I've lost my mic. Sorry, I should have put it inside my shirt, as you advised. Um, the, um, is this whole rise of rape banter. Again, two words that should never be put together, because I don't think there's any such thing as a banter about something as serious as rape. But it exists in all sorts of different contexts. Gaming. You know, the whole idea that somebody is raped if you defeat them in a, in a computer game. The idea that if your hair is in a mess, you know, it's a rape, you've been raped, it's your rape hairstyle. See it on Facebook. And more seriously, that um, website Unilad, which some of you may be familiar with, which actually, um, they, they have things on it like, you know she's playing hard to get when you're chasing her down an alleyway. Um, but that idea that rape can be turned into a bit of fun and implying that women are just playing hard to get and all the rest of it. In fact, some of the comments were so bad that they were told they had to apologise for it. And Facebook said they would allow it all to stay on there because it was really humour. Um, it wasn't really genuinely meaning that they were encouraging people to rape. Um, so this, this idea that this can be treated as ironic and humour, to me, is, shows just how deep um, sort of... There's a, there's a greater sort of tolerance, if you like, in the mainstream society for sexism, for women being treated as sex objects. You know, to be honest, it's, it's, it's gone backwards in many ways, that, I think, in terms of how women are treated and their bodies are treated. And, and actually, you know, this idea that um, this assumption, if you like, that woman's um, body, if you like, her value, her greatest value she can offer is her, her body as a sex object. It's something that I think is encouraged from young girls at an early and early age, isn't it? And I think that can seep in to everybody in the sense of worrying about diet and fashion and, you know, even to the extent of many more young women having cosmetic surgery, that whole women in one family that were in the papers last week, all of them have had a huge breast Im implants and the young 14-year-old is being persuaded by them to do the same thing when she's 18. But this, that's the extremity, if you like, but it's far more mainstream now for women to think that really, unless they've got a body that looks like in the magazine and remember they're photoshopped even the models can't even look as perfect as you're meant to look with our photoshop but this is what we're encouraged to aspire to and I think that can end up making women feel like women's oppression is a sort of psychological problem it's a personality disorder it's feeling shit about yourself it's feeling you don't look good in this or feeling that you don't you know that you're not you're not thin enough you're not tall enough you're not sexy enough or you're not behaving in the same way you don't want to wear the same clothes and it can turn into something internalized but it isn't rooted in our heads it's rooted in society and actually the ideas that we've got about ourselves and other people and that men and women have about each other is rooted in the world. It reflects the material world, it's not the cause of it. And I think that at the moment, I think what's interesting is we're seeing a resurgence of interest in recent years about feminism, about women's liberation, about the ideas to challenge this because there is a reaction against this, uh, this, uh, this very crude sexism. And I think that's just brilliant. You know, it's brilliant that there's uh, more groups, more activities, more marches about whether it is about abortion rights, whether it's about the slut walks. I didn't like the name, but I was in them because it was important to, to march against what a cop in Canada who said, you know, if you don't want to be raped, don't dress like a slut. You know, it's actually um, the idea that people challenged that was fantastic and they were exuberant, militant demonstrations and ab absolutely brilliant. But I think what's interesting, if we talk about feminism and Marxism, you see, feminism really, there isn't one movement, there isn't one idea, is there, that's feminism. It can be something for everybody in a way. I mean, to the extent that actually, um, um, you know, Theresa May has been photographed wearing a T-shirt saying, this is what a feminist looks like. I think it should say, this is what a Tory bigot looks like. But... Um, <laughs> But the idea that it could even reach, if you like, an umbrella. Now, the fact is, Theresa May faces sexism. They're always going on about her kitten heels and her clothes and her hair. The women in the parliament, how many times have I read articles about they don't get the roots of their grey hair touched up? You know, who cares? It's about the politics, isn't it? But actually, so therefore, even ruling class rich women face sexism. So you can see on that level, if feminism is just about fighting for equality, then actually there's no reason for Theresa May not to say it. And, but I, I want to say that for me as a socialist, I want to go beyond equality because you don't fight for equality in an unequal world. So we're equal with working class poor blokes and the women can be equal with their rich ruling class men. You know, this isn't, the, this isn't the way forward. It would be an improvement if we were all equal and there was no gender discrimination, but it would still leave class, society and inequality intact. And Alexander Kollontai, a brilliant revolutionary, put it like this in 1930 about what she called bourgeois feminists, middle class feminists, who appeared to be striving just for equality and not, you know, with the men of their class and not more. And she said their aim is to achieve the same advantages, the same power, the same rights with capitalist society as those possessed now by their husbands, fathers and brothers. What is the aim of women workers, in contrast? Their aim is to abolish all privileges 
privileges <coughs> deriving from birth or wealth, i.e. all privileges for everybody they want to get rid of. And she made that, that different. And therefore, I think that we can see that those women in the ruling class who are fighting for equality within their class doesn't stop them oppressing and exploiting women in the working class, whether it's employing them to be cleaners, whether it's saying there should be low pay for public sector workers, the majority of whom are women, you know, whether it's about single parents, whether it's about taking benefits off people who with disabilities and who's going to look after those people if they can't be, live independently, be women in the family. You know, we can see what this government is doing that is actually going to have an enormous disproportionate impact on working class women. So for me, the sort of revolutionary socialist Marxist tradition says more than fighting for equality. I want to fight for equality. There shouldn't be inequality, but we're fighting for something more. And actually, you know, therefore, for us, women's oppression is something that's it's deeply entrenched in society that we have to address. I mean, Leon Trotsky, one of the uh, leaders of the Russian Revolution, he said to to challenge the conditions of to change the conditions of life, you have to see them through the eyes of a woman. Now, he said that because you have to understand oppression, he was going. You have to understand those people who suffer the most in society to understand what it's like for them in order for, for you to really fundamentally change society. And I, and I think, you know, for, for me, I'd sort of talk about it that we're materialists. You know, we understand it as being in the root, oppression rooted in the material world. And actually, the key institution and structure, which Marxists argue that uh, women's oppression is, is, is the family. Now, that's not to say we go around with, with placards saying, die with the family, get rid of the family, and we'll all be free. But it's understanding how the family is a contradictory sort of institution society. It can be the place where we feel love and comfort and unconditional support. It can also be a violent, oppressive place where you can never live up to the expectations of your parents or your siblings or where you, at worst, suffer violence, where actually um, you can uh, suffer all sorts of abuse. So that the, the cauldron, if you like, that's meant to be that we all dream of this perfect personal family, you know, where the kids are always good and if they make the place messy it in a tricks it's all cleaned up with you know the latest product you know this is something we're meant to aspire to this it's eulogized in advertising and the media by politicians but of course for most of us that's not how we live actually you know more people now live outside the so-called traditional family but there is a sense that this is still the place where the expectations of us as a gender of women and of men of being the provider, of being strong, of never crying, of really not being good with kids. You know, all sorts of expectations. Are, we're socialised into being this way um, in the family. And I think this is why we have to understand women's oppression by looking at the whole of capitalism as a totality, not just looking at it through the prism of gender, because looking through the prism of gender is something that I think ends up being a cul-de-sac that stops you actually truly appreciating how, how bad oppression can be if, if, you, if you intersect it, if you like, with class, with working, being working class, with being exploited. And now, just to say, you know, we're often, Marxists and socialists are often told that we're reductionist or we're economistic. You know, we don't really understand it. We're only really worried about jobs and pay and, you know, these sorts of things. And, and actually, we reduce everything to class. We reduce everything to economics. And I don't believe that for a moment. I think, actually, seeing oppression and class as being intertwined is, is the only true way to appreciate the sheer, you know, burden, if you like, and the, and, and the sheer sort of force that oppression can be experienced. And far from reducing it to class, we don't, it's because partly I refer to Theresa May suffers it, you know, so it does cut across. But that, that sense of what the difference it is for her to be have a few headlines about her kitten heels, Theresa May, than it is to be a working class woman who's just lost benefit or has been told she has to go and seek work because now they've changed the law about how old your children should be, etc. It's utterly different. And so therefore, you know, I want to look at class for a moment then, because you see, there are plenty of people who talk about class in society today. You know, there's no doubt about that. I mean, Polly Toynbee, other mainstream commentators. But they talk about class really like a static thing, like you're in a box, like you're working class, or you're poor. People don't mind talking about poverty and poor, being poor. Um, and the other side is the Tories don't talk about, oh dear, you're poor. They talk about, you're feckless. Or, or biggest talk about chavs, don't they? Chavs are these working class people that really don't deserve benefits. They just want to have a life on the dole, a free council house, you know, this great life. What a great life on the dole, you know, struggling in a tar block that's probably lost its lift and isn't being properly uh, kept up and it's lost its caretaker because of the cuts. You know, the idea that any of them would ever aspire to this and they, they believe that working class young women and men aspire to it is, is a nonsense. But there is that sense more and more, isn't there, that working class people, you know, if they're not out there busting and gut travelling all over the country for a job that isn't there, then really they don't deserve any support. And so therefore, I, for me, I, I don't believe that's how we should see class. I don't see class as a static box that you're put in or not even in terms of just economic inequality. 
It's a social relationship of exploitation in, in society. It's if you're exploited or have to sell your labour power to work, if you have to go to work and earn a wage, effectively, it makes you working class. If you, if you live off somebody else's labour, you're not working class. You know? Now, there is in-betweens and things in the middle, but in, in the ultimate sort of thing that we want to talk about is, is that social relationship. And you know, all the wealth in society depends on the work of people like us in the room. Nothing happens in society if we don't all get up in the morning and go to work. Because, you know, if Theresa May doesn't go to work, we really don't notice, do we? Okay, maybe, you know, a few people don't get banged up with no trial, you know, this sort of thing. But actually, you know, the reality is we are the people that do, that make, that make everything happen. But what's interesting, you see, what's happened, the other change, when I talked about the gains that we've made, you know, since the sort of 1960s, 1970s, one of them is, is being financially, the opportunity, if there are jobs, for it to be financially independent and not just be, you're meant to live off a man's wage. And that is because women have got sucked into the workforce in enormous numbers. And we're now 50% of the working class of the, of, of the workforce. Now, that can be hard work for a woman who's struggling to get by with childcare and everything else. And, you know, there was a woman who spoke from Norway in an earlier meeting today, and I thought it was really good because she said, we've got lots of equality in Norway, but it doesn't mean we've got women's liberation because you're rushing from childcare to job. And, you know, so these things aren't solutions. But the fact is, women going to work has been an enormous gain because not, it doesn't just give you the possibility of financial independence. It gives you something else. It gives you the power to organise collectively and not just be at home, isolated, and being seen as somebody who's powerless. Oppression divides you. Oppression makes you powerless. Being exploited gives you the opportunity in that collective organisation of the class to actually fight. And that's what makes the big difference. And I think this is something that is a positive thing about the debate, that actually the struggle that women have as part of the working class, I think, shows the huge potential we have for making a change. I don't believe there's two struggles, one about women's oppression and one about um, fighting exploitation and fighting the boss. I think you can't separate the two. I think where we're powerful is where we can beat in both things that actually, you know, in the sense of dividing them up, it makes us weaker if we just think we're going to organise as women about sexism and then we're going to organise as a class about something else. I believe we want to organise against what is wrong in society together in a collective where we're, where we're strong. Because if we just fight sexism and expressions of sexism, we're just fighting the symptoms, aren't we? And like a zombie, it'll just keep coming back at us if we don't also, at the same time, fight the cause. So I'm not arguing we have to wait for the revolution, brothers and sisters, and then we'll get rid of women's oppression, but don't fight on the here and now. We fight every issue in the here and now. Sexist images, sexist language, rape banter, the horrible jokes that comedians are allowed to make on the radio and TV now as if, as if the women's liberation movement never happened. Everything, low pay, you name it, we fight it in the here and now, but also at the same time understanding that we want every struggle to make us stronger for a bigger battle, a bigger battle about the sort of society that breeds oppression in the first class in the first place. And this is my final point really, is what the ruling class want to do right now in the middle of austerity, in the middle of this economic crisis, is play us off each other. They want to say it's the migrant workers who are undercutting the jobs or taking the jobs that are there. Or women don't really need the jobs as much. You, you thought you wouldn't have heard this since the 50s, but they're saying it, aren't they? Well, women don't need the jobs so much. Men are the providers. Perhaps they should have the jobs and not the women. And you go through this, and they want to divide us. Private and sector, public sector. Women, men, you name it. And therefore, we have to say, no, we're not going to be divided because our liberation or our equality cannot come at the expense of somebody else. That's not liberation. That's just a new oppression being created by, um, by, uh, by what the Tories want to do. And make no mistake about it, the Tories are coming after us, working class people and women. They are coming after us. They want the jobs, they want the public sector. Now, the fact is, the majority of jobs in the public sector are women, women working jobs. It's partly a, a fluke of history of when women come into the workforce, etc. I don't have time to go into it. But that's one reason why women are getting especially attacked of austerity. The other side is, Many of the services provided by the welfare state and by the public sector are actually relied upon by women um, who still have the uh, burden of uh, um, overwhelmingly take responsibility for bringing up the next generation of children and looking after the elderly or the sick or people with disabilities in their family. And therefore the cuts have this disproportionate effect on pushing the burden back into the family. So this may be a woman who has a job who now has to worry about whether an elderly relative is going to not have a home to, uh, you know, a supported home to live in, that she is going to have to look after them as well. And therefore the ideological arguments about the family are back with a vengeance, aren't they? That it's all, if we all sat around and 
had dinner together every night, society would be great. You know, as if that's going to create jobs and bring EMA back. You know what I mean? It's nonsense. But, and now we're getting the situation where um, the, um, the idea of troubled families. It's troubled families that mean your kids come to school without having had breakfast. No, that's poverty. That, that means that kids didn't have something to eat before they went in. But this idea that it's about troubled families, that the Tories are going to intervene, they're even going to intervene with people sometimes before they've even had a baby, because they're going to be a troubled family. And actually, understanding poverty, class, is the only way we can, we can address this. And I think that for, um, for us as women, if you look across history, our, the fate of women, if you like, has always been tied to the fate of the working class. When the working class has been rising, when it's been fighting, the, the women's rights has come with it. When we've been crushed, when we push back at its most extreme under fascism, but even under right-wing governments like the Tories, women's rights have been pushed. So that sense of actually being tied to the struggle is absolutely vital. And that's why it was so fantastic on the 30th of November to have the biggest strike of women that's ever happened in Britain. It was bloody amazing, wasn't it? That strike of 2.6 million people, the majority of whom were women, it was superb. But hey... We have to fight as a class, because if we just thought about it as being women, you would A, you'd have taken out 40% of the strike and said, no, it should just be women. And also, look at the union leaders. This time last year, uh, on a platform, I was talking about women in the unions and saying, actually, 15 unions are now led by women. Now, that's a brilliant thing. It's shifting things, because it's been too male-dominated at the top. But can we guarantee those women are going to lead the most militant fight, never sell a side, never witch hunt the left? No. Because gender isn't the decider, is it? It's politics, it's, it's class interest and all the rest of it. And I think... Therefore, what happens on the ground with rank and file organisation, with women and men making those links and fighting, 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 fighting together all the time, that's what will change ideas, that's what will make us feel part. That's real empowerment, is the struggle, because the struggle is what changes things. The beauty of actually arguing that working class struggle is the way forward is you don't have to win everybody to the idea that you've got to be a feminist or a socialist before you fight, because capitalism makes people fight despite themselves and actually when they fight they start to understand who are their friends who are their enemies what makes you strong and what's going to help you win and that's the vital key the struggle changes all of us it makes us feel stronger and more confident it makes men realize that women are their sisters in struggle and therefore that whole process is what brings us nearer to being able to envisage a society where oppression doesn't exist and therefore i think that for us at the moment what the struggles show us is we can be more than the mere objects of history women are not just victims we can be class fighters. We can see tremendous, courageous class fighters across the globe, and we can see it in this country today. And so for me, that's why being a revolutionary socialist and seeing class as a critical divide in society that is, means that, for me, women's oppression is not just something that we're going to be describing forever and for centuries. It'll always be there. It's something that is rooted in a society that we can get rid of, and we can actually win this and create a society where women's oppression will be looked back on as being some awful aberration of history that... Future generations of young women and men will, simply won't believe we lived that way. Well, um, if you take anything from this evening, it's that you shouldn't ever agree to follow Judith Ward on a platform. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll make do. Um, if you, um, you'll see a lot of blogs, a lot of articles in um, the sort of more um, lefty liberal first lately that talks about how feminism's back. Because obviously for the past sort of 30, 40 years, women have just been hanging out. So not really doing anything, just relaxing. But um, I think the sort of real reason, actually, that we almost, I think, not only act, quite actively see more um, feminist activism. If you were here in Bloomsbury a month ago, you'd have seen um, the opposition to the uh, 40 Days of Life um, activity outside um, the Bloomsbury Beef House Clinic that Judith spoke about. And you'll have seen sort of women out there, women and men, in fact, out there every single day um, challenging these sort of attitudes. Because I think what feminism's not back because it never went away. I think what's back is a particularly nasty, vicious politics, a politics of hate that very much is practised actually by the people who are, and I really don't know how this happened, are in charge of the country. Um, I think in the current political climate where you have a class of people who are in charge who actually been brought up to think that that's where they should be, I think David Cameron wakes up every day and, I mean, I don't want to really think about David Cameron waking up every day, <laughs> but I don't think he ever goes, oh gosh, I'm Prime Minister. I think he just believes he should be there. I mean, in fact, I think he probably believes he should be on a, another house, a sort of couple of streets over, quite the big one. You might have seen it a bit on the TV lately. Um, but this is also a, a class of people, and particularly a group of people, because this particular government are 
in a way that perhaps even Thatcher's government weren't, are very much from that ruling class. They're not sort of people who are proud to say, you know, I've come up from the middle classes. They are people who are born to rule. And in that, um, this almost sort of disgust you see from Cameron and the like when they're challenged on anything, when they're challenged by people they feel are sort of below them. And that politics of hate, I think, has really seeped out and actually allowed some of those people. And sadly enough, a lot of those people are our MPs who have a real sort of, I think, a real visceral hatred for women. And I do include people like Nadine Dolly's in there. So I believe women can be misogynist, and I think she's certainly sort of number one on, uh, well, certainly my hit list. Um, <laughs> it's very easy for them to come out and sort of, preach these politics of hate, yes, they might dress it up and talk about, you know, an economic need for X, Y and Z, or they might talk about a return to basic family values. I wouldn't like to be part of the Dolly's family. It's very Adam's family, like it seems to me. But it's sort of very easy. And actually, when we talk about why this is happening, I think some of the things Judith touched upon, the fact that far too often we don't discuss class and why it's so essential is because some of these attacks happen because, frankly, people are far too complacent. And the rise in neoliberalism has sort of left a very, really ingrained individualistic stand on our society. Not to say that it didn't exist before, but automatically the sort of, those community bonds, those bonds with people in your unions, people you'd be active with, look at the downcrease in political party membership, the downturn in trade union membership, and look at things like that and see actually society is very, very self-centred. So when, you know me, I'm from a sort of nice sort of middle class family. Now if I'd have got pregnant when I was 16, other than the fact it would have probably been the second coming of Jesus, because <laughs> I, I don't, I'd, I'd, have, um, I'd, have had, I'd have had a lot of choices. Um, I've received sex education in school, so actually I might not have even gotten that situation in the first place. I had um, a family who were very open about these things, you know, they educated, so I'd have had the choice to have an abortion. Also, if I'd wanted to keep that child, I'd have had that choice as well. So, for me, in my personal life, ah, of course, it's all completely fine. I'd have been whisked off to a doctor's surgery, that with my incredibly terrifying mother, to tell the doctors what to do. The whole two doctors thing wouldn't have been an issue to me. However, um, and yeah, that's sort of the bubble a lot of people live in. However, let's actually look at sort of where the real choices are. You're the woman who's actually not been very well educated, and when a doctor says to you, oh, come on, you need a cooling off period, you're not inclined to argue with this person that you've been told for your entire life is someone you listen to, someone who's, you know, your superior. When you live in a small sort of rural community, where, again, we're seeing sort of cutbacks and medical provision, so can do, and you can only see one doctor and you maybe have to wait one week, two weeks to see someone else. Do you have that choice? And then actually, who's going to look after that child? Is it that sort of free childcare that feminists 40 years ago thought um, you know, they'd, they'd get? Certainly that doesn't happen. Childcare prices are absolutely astronomical. Um, who's helping you? I mean, do you go to work? Well, there aren't any jobs. But if you stay at home, um, you don't really get many benefits and you condemn for that. But... What happens is people are so unaware, I think, of actually that's the reality for so many people. A lot of people who are very much engaged, the people who are the decision makers, the people who go out and vote in elections, the people whose comments are considered sort of important by politicians, are people who have absolutely no idea what is happening to the vast majority of people who not only live in the same country, but live in the same town cities, even sometimes on the same streets as them. Um, I think where this is sort of best shown, there's been an article that's um, been shared quite a lot this week from the US. Um, a US professor has written an article talking about actually now women can sort of have it all. They've got the choice to um, go to work, there's their family, they can do X, Y and Z, but isn't it a bit difficult? Well, that's her choice. She's a very well-educated university professor who's writing an article about this in the New York Times. And there's absolutely no analysis in that at all of what it's like for those millions of women living in poverty in America, the system that, you know, we complain about the welfare system here, and rightly we should, but compare it to the US, where, I mean, some of the worst ideas being input into our welfare system have come from sort of there. And it's just this sort of inability to almost sort of see, we're too busy looking at the glass ceilings, we haven't even noticed the sticky floor. 
Um, God, I'm quite funny, thanks. Um, but, but when we talk about um, the economic um, impacts of what the current government are doing on women, and um, Judith mentioned sort of the impact on sort of public sector workers. And this is also, some of these impacts are really wrapped up in an assumption of what women's roles are as well. So we see massive swathes cut from social care budgets. And the expectation is, that, oh, there'll be a woman at home who'll, who'll fill that role. There'll be someone who'll do that. And of course, actually, then in a family where someone's, if you're in you know, a, a traditional family, it's very likely the woman will be earning less money. So of course, they'll stay at home. So when David Cameron sort of stands there and goes, oh, I'm very passionate about paternity leave. Well, I'm very sure you are when your wife's on like 150 grand a year because she makes diaries or something. It's very bizarre, look it up. <laughs> and, you know, you're able to afford you know, various nannies, etc. but you still manage to leave your daughter in a pub. Like, <laughs> my dad's from Glasgow and I've never been left in a pub. And that man's allowed to run the country. That's But... There's sort of absolutely kind of no ideas of choice. And again, it's this um, sort of ideas from the government that go, well, of course, we'd love to make it easier for women to stay at home. <coughs> yeah, so, you know, if your husband's got, got a job in the city, or still got a job in the city, probably still got a job in the city, I don't know what we have to do to get sacked from being a banker. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds amazing. I might take it up by rubbish at maths. Although, again... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I... So, you know, the, you're the wife, your wife of a banker, you've probably been to Oxford, I, I don't know, I don't know these people. Um, but, so you have four children, aren't you a saint for staying at home and looking after them? Aren't you absolutely lovely? That's some photos of the house in Hello. Oh, isn't it very nice? Oh, what, you live on a council estate and you've got four children, you absolute slag. <laughs> well, I mean, it's not my words, that's the words of the uh, Secretary of State for Work and Pensions. But, um, but it is this sort of attitude where this kind of false, these false notions of choice totally ignore actually any real things in society. So, Judy spoke earlier about um, the differences between when she was at university complaining about the rugby team putting on like a strict night and actually my time in the student movement it's very much talking to both men and women about actually why we probably shouldn't have the pole dancing night um, every single week but it's, it's it's this sort of these kind of ideas that people don't really see what's really going on in the world. And it's like, well, I've made a decision. And a refusal to acknowledge that sort of anything's bad outside their own personal sphere. And actually, that is very much a problem of a neoliberal society. A society that is totally obsessed with wealth accumulation, just for, often just for the sake of it. Because actually, when you're looking at... Um, you know, bankers' bonuses is the thing everyone talks about. And you know, people say, oh, that's an obscene amount of money. And... So it is, and it's money for the sake of having money, because somehow having money makes you better than a whole lot of people. And the refusal to sort of acknowledge the impacts your obsession with sort of gaining wealth has on, on anyone else, I think actually isn't um, exclusively something with sort of the super rich. It's something that's evident, at, I think, all sort of we've got kind of levels of society, and I think that's sort of quite deeply sad, sort of, in a way. But... I think um, also um, some of the stuff Judith spoke about was, you know, there's increasing attacks on sort of the ideas of women's rights and um, women's movement. I think there are two sort of quite, uh, there's sort of three sort of distinct um, sort of ways this happens. Um, so if you're talking about um, sort of objectification and things like this, you're, you don't, you're not fun, you're prudish, and it's that co-option actually all too often, of the language of women's rights to throw it back in the faces of people campaigning for that. So it's liberating to have a pole dancing night. It's empowering that we've still got page three in the sun. And it's that also, very often, it's businesses, it's companies who are taking those words, twisting them and using them to make a profit. Um, I once did a radio debate with um, the man who's the vice president of Spearmint Rhino, um, 
in the UK. We got on really well. Um, so if you're not familiar with uh, Spearmint Rhino, well, it sort of sounds like a really disgusting energy drink. It's actually a disgusting pole dancing club. Um, it's one on Tottenham Court Road. Yay, see you all there later. Um, but um, he, what I found remarkable during this debate is he was actually talking about some of the things I was. So he was saying, well, students are doing it because of uh, student debt. And he goes, so actually, tuition fees are great, aren't they? I wasn't saying tuition fees are great. I'll throw that in. Um, because it means more people get to work in our clubs and it's really empowering for them. Now, I sort of thought, have I accidentally taken a load of drugs this morning? <laughs> I hadn't. Um, he was just awful. But there's this sort of twisting of, like, the language of women's rights and the actual twisting of things around sexual liberation and turning them back onto women and almost using them as weapons and certainly using them to things to um, line pockets because often it's the, um, it's the same men who'll be reading sort of a lads mag and will give you the justification for doing it and will often be the same people who will shout slag out to a woman on the street because she doesn't want to sleep with them. I still don't quite know how that works. <laughs> But I think that other, other than that sort of kind of co-option, that sort of very a bit of the banter police, there seems to be, I, mean, I don't know what that means, sort of attitude you get from a lot of people who really buy into these ideas of hyper-masculinity. And I think it's important to mention that as well, because I would, whilst it's not like great being a young woman, I sort of prefer it to being a, like, a 20-something-year-old man, because the idea that you are somehow not behaving correctly, as you are getting out, sort of, Pretty much sexually assaulting women every time you see them, and just you know sitting there downing pints of really disgusting lager, kind of going all the time. You're somehow not behaving properly. Like, oh, you're such a letdown if that's not what you've been doing. Your parents must be so disappointed in you. Um, sort of that. Or well, there's there's also a very sort of personal attacks on women, and I think actually. Um, it's been interesting, um, Laurie Penny, someone who experiences that all the time, take a look at her mentions on Twitter and look at the sort of, if, you, if, people, if someone ever says to you, oh, misogyny doesn't really exist anymore, take a look at the way women are treated. So you'll hear, um, so I'm sure most people in the room are probably on Twitter. I think you're probably legally obliged to only have events where 70% of the room's on Twitter now. But you... The things you get, it's not, you're an idiot, it's, you're a slag. It's not, oh, I think that's a really stupid point. I think that's a really stupid point, and I'm going to rape you. These are the sort of things you get. And the sort of just, I think, abuse just any woman gets, if you put a view out there, sort of utterly vile. But I just wanted to give another example, because so much has been written about it. Um, there's um, this YouTube channel and uh, blog called Feminist Frequency, and the woman who runs it um, is called uh, Anita Sarkozy. And what she does is she does little videos talking about like a sort of feminism in pop culture and things. And they're really interesting. I suggest you check them out. So what she did, she went into video games and stuff. So she um, there's this thing called Kickstarter. So if you want to start a project, you go on it and you ask people to donate money to it. And she wanted money to do a series of videos about sort of um, tropes of women in video games. Um, so, sort of how are women portrayed? So, it's a series of videos. So, fair enough. I mean, you don't have to donate. Um, you don't even have to look at the page if you don't want to, which seemed to be news to a lot of um, people online because um, actually, I don't think you can talk about sort of sexism unless you talk about the internet because people seem to think if you type something sort of sat in your living room, well, probably your parents' living room these people um, like, and someone can't see your face if that's sort of okay something people would never say someone on the street it's probably a different thing and so she started getting abuse she got abusive comments on her YouTube channel and page on her thing and then it sort of progressively got worse so um, her page got hacked her websites got hacked came up people started posting her address and telephone number online, along with the usual sort of misogynistic threats you get online, how she was, you know, a slag who deserved to die. It's all, people are always sort of slags and whores. It's very, I think people probably have quite a Catholic education, if that's the only way you sort of see women, isn't it? Um, but people saying what they do to her, why she deserved to die. And um, t so 
she's spoken a lot about this, and today I came across something that where someone has created a online game where you beat her up as part of a game. This is alongside sort of various kind of pornographic drawings and images, doctor photos and things, and it's um, so it's a photo of her face, and you sort of have to play it, and then it just becomes bloody and bruised. And the one, and one of the criticisms um, on the comment section was, great idea, but it's very poorly executed. So um, there's there's someone with their file that is in chat, but that's just one person who's chosen to be very public about it, and the abuse only got worse when. Um, sort of, she spoke when she spoke about it, but she still continues to speak about it, which I think is excellent. But I think we can't kid ourselves that this sort of personal abuse is something that's restricted to the internet. Um, it's sort of every time um, there'll be people in the room of being on a reclaim the night march. Um, if you ever go on a small reclaim the night march, you'll notice there's more. But for some reason, people can't really deal with groups of women together, and they stand there and they shout what they're going to do to you. Um, usually pick kind of the sort of smallest looking woman they can find and like why you're all, again, slags and whores. These people need to find some new words. But, um, you know, it, it's not that kind of thing. It's the people who I spoke at um, a fringe at NUS conference, um, that's the National Union of Students, just in April. And at the end of the meeting when everyone had played, I was surrounded by about 10 people to have a go at me about what I'd said. They waited until sort of, I was by myself. I told them to fuck off. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so I think the thing is, I think it's actually being very aware of things because usually if I discuss things like this, you always find people don't believe you. So you tell people you need two doctor signatures to have an abortion, they don't believe you. Um, I don't really know how you prove it, unless you sort of go take them and try to get an abortion. Um, like, people tell you that the government ignored equality legislation and got taken to court because, it, it, because it, this coalition government's first budget was so, has such a massive impact on women. You tell people that the justice minister says there's, there's rape and there's classic rape, because rape isn't a soft drink, Ken, so let's not, you know. And people don't really believe the sort of things you talk to them about because people are so insular and sort of actually if it's not happened to me it hasn't really happened to anyone so I think that's why actually I don't think you can be a feminist and not be a socialist um, that's why I think when Theresa May wears that t-shirt I just go you're not love jog on but it's obviously I would definitely say to Theresa May all right love because that's, that's the type of person I am <laughs> but Actually, why, also why I think um, feminism and socialism are actually so important. I think if you're a socialist activist, you should also... Def I mean, I think by default you are a feminist activist. But also why it's important to notice it, because when one group faces continual oppression, that will only ever be exploited sort of by people to make money. It's exploited. Objectification is used as a way to exploit women for money. The fact that people believe all over the world they can pay women less because they value them less. It's exploitation for money. And I think the things are so inherently linked. I think we do ourselves a disservice when we don't stop doing our activism and look around and think, of, actually, we should think about it together, but we should also think about the people who make up those different parts and think actually about how capitalism exploits different people. So always have feminism, and always have, you know, frankly, gets homophobia at the front of your mind, etc., etc. So I just think that's the sensible way to do it, and that's actually how you stop something, not by thinking in an insular way, but thinking about everyone together, but, you know, think about the sum of the parts, and that's it. So thank you. Sorry, by removing capitalism, how will that change the gender relations between men and women? So the misogyny and the other attitudes we've been talking about. And I think the reliance on, say, women to be the primary childcare, because we bear children at the moment, what, why and how would that change? Thanks. Um, I'm not too good at public speaking, so please bear with me. Um, basically, I wanted to talk a little bit about my experience this year. Um, um, on our campus, we faced a lot of sexism. Um, our, recently, our president last year, um, our president of last year recently posted a link from UniLad. 
of something because it was mildly amusing. And um, when challenged on that, he um, I posted a picture of um, Sarah McAlpine's um, f- um, sort of copies of the articles that condoned rape. He said that um, he he didn't post that because it wasn't funny. And then on the same post, I was told to get back to the kitchen. He didn't challenge that. I know it's the classic joke and it's hilarious. We're all still laughing at it. Mm. Get back to the kitchen. Um, Funny thing was, I was in the kitchen at the time. So um, (laughs) We've also also faced a lot of sexism within activism, um, within student activism and also um, within um, Anonymous, our local Anonymous um, group are... uh, post a lot of um, misogynistic things. Um, our union has also um, created a sports calendar to raise money for a charity. Fair enough, it's for a charity, but it was all, um, there were people excluded from sort of like teams that are excluded that weren't aesthetically as pleasing as other teams. Um, there's been a lot of sexism. Um, when there was, when um, NUS conference was on and I was um, sort of speaking to my sabbatical officers to try and say I want to vote for this person um, because I think, you know, they're, they're a good candidate. I was told that I, I wanted to vote for the candidate because she was female, I was sexist, and that women's representation is a joke and that I shouldn't... I basically didn't, didn't have the right to say what I was saying. Um, I've had misogynistic texts, loads of other activists have as well. Um, and it came to a head when um, TNS, the National Student Magazine, posted an article... Um, which I've written for the National Student Magazine, posted an article called 10 Women Who Will Sleep With You. Um, one, uh, there were a few different categories. One was the slag, because she'll sleep with anything. Uh, one was the fat chick, because um, her self-esteem is low enough that she'll, you know, she's easy as well. One was girls with a lot of piercings, because they obviously like to be um, penetrated. Um, there was the ugly chick, because, um, you know... What she lacks in the face, she'll make up, up for in the bedroom. And it was then that I saw this sort of like radical, sorry, radical group of um, feminist activists come together um, on my campus. And then um, a few, it was a couple of weeks after when the NUS demo date was announced. And um, I was surprised to find that those um, feminist activists came back to me on that one. And um, they were actually asking me to go to the union for them so that we could get our union um, to put on transport to this and basically my point was I've been very long winded my point was that the feminist cause can also um, can also create sort of like radical class activists as well that's it Thanks. Um, I'd just like to thank you for bringing up the um, feminist frequency story because um, I used to be like avidly into the video game culture and I think it's something that we shouldn't ignore because I think video game budgets and sales have out, uh, outstripped films you know, uh, and, and music CDs combined and I think it's part of youth culture now, it's, it, it's quite huge in youth culture and you do see misogyny within, within it and I think it's very important to, uh, to, to look at video game culture and take it seriously you know what I mean, as seriously as we take films, as books, etc. Um, there's also an interesting story, which I don't go into, and I don't know whether you've seen, about a writer for a video game called Jennifer Hepler. I don't know whether you read this. She suffered ridiculous amounts of abuse just because she thought that narrative was more important than action in games, and she was developing a specific game. It's quite boring, but you should, you should have a look at it because it's very, very interesting. It's quite complicated. Uh, that's Jennifer Hepler. Okay. Thanks Thank a lot. Thank you. I am uh, from the Irish Social Workers Party. In our, in, back in March, April, uh, five of our TDs uh, in the United Left Alliance, including one of our own, Richard Boy Barrett, uh, who's also a Social Workers Party TD, put a private member's bill uh, on a, a bar- trying to uh, get abortion uh, based on the, the, on the X case. Some of you uh, may have heard of it uh, 20 years ago. Uh, fortunately, it was defeated, but uh, we're tr- but we are getting uh, we are getting it in, into the conscious of people. Unfortunately, we're uh, also getting uh, well. Fortunately, it has also attracted uh, a group of far right, uh, a group called Youth Defence, have been uh, backed by some very uh, I would I would call 
rich type of UKIP type of people. Uh, they have built on billboards. Uh, now, whether you're for or against abortion, uh, it, like abortion should not be a billboard issue, but it is. There's a lot of money going into them. This already in Belfast. Uh, uh, there's a, a, a lot of uh, Irish uh, pro-choice people and people on the left are going to Belfast to uh, counter rally uh, youth defence and a couple of pe uh, people from a tiny far-right Nazi group called Democratic uh, Right Movement. Uh, I also want to touch upon. Uh, yes, yes. Sorry, yeah. uh, just uh, there's a show you have here uh, here in the United Kingdom it's called the Jeremy Kyle Show. Now that <laughs> promotes uh, that that uh, stigmatizes a lot of women uh, as well as working class men. And to be honest with you, I think uh, proposal should be to try and shut down that show because that is a that's one hell of a. <laughs> Okay. That's all I want to say, uh, but uh, keep the fight going. Thank you. Hi, um, I just finished secondary school and I went to a secondary school in Newham and I just wanted to make a quick contribution about the rise of um, sexism and rape in secondary schools. And I think as I became more politically active, I started to notice a lot of the comments that some of the young boys in my school made that were extremely sexist, stuff about, oh, if you want to see things from a woman's point of view, why don't you look out the kitchen window? And um, things like, when you're with them, they'll be like, make me a sandwich, it's your duty. And, and loads of comments like that. And uh, as when I began to became older from about 14 plus, a lot of the girls that I started to know were, were getting raped. And it wasn't just once or twice, and it wasn't just by one person or two people, it was by a lot of people. And I think one of the most times that it shocked me the most when I think about a month ago, two boys that I knew got um, three, one to three years in prison. And a lot of the girls that had known him and known both of them and a lot of the boys that had, had known both of them were coming on his Facebook wall like, oh, um, we'll see you soon, we'll write to you, we're going to come visit you. And a lot of people, because they knew the, the, knew the boy, dismissed it. Said, no, it can't be true. It's not true. It, that, that doesn't happen. They wouldn't, they wouldn't do that and those kind of things. And it was like, it probably wasn't rape, she probably lied. And it's just like, sorry. Um, yeah, and it's about the, the, the demand of young boys that think that, oh, sex is a, is a right. They deserve to have sex with girls. And it's not, nothing to do with the girl's choice or nothing to do with the woman's choice. It's, it's they, they can demand it and they will receive it. And just one more, one more point. I pointed out to some of my teachers when I was in secondary school that this was going on and nothing was done about it. There was no, no sex education. There was no... Um, 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 classes for girls. There was no assemblies. There was no nothing. It was just left like that, and a lot of left a lot of girls to suffer. And yeah, I guess basically. Right. Thinking about of, of the idea about kind of sexism being repackaged, which both Judith and Esther mm -hmm. they, uh, they both commented on. Um, I was also wondering, in the case of employment, could you argue that um, the kind of ideas surrounding kind of essentialist arguments about femininity that women are naturally more expressive and naturally sort of better at communicating. Um, those ideas have almost kind of forced a whole layer of women into very, very low paid jobs. Um, so it's almost like your values, which we do see as quite empowering and, and um, positive, are sort of being repackaged in a very um, kind of overtly sexist way. Um, and also the effect this has on working class men, that they're, they're deemed as very bad at communicating and very, um, it almost, it kind of justifies the argument from Tories that men um, working class men are kind of feckless and lazy and uh, so it, again it kind of links to Judith's point that sexism affects both men and women and that's why we should fight on like a socialist like why, why we should fight for socialism Thanks. Um, I wanted to talk about the new kind of like phenomenon that is Fifty Shades of Grey <laughs> I've heard a lot of interviews, especially on like BBC Radio 2 and BBC Radio 4, that this book is liberating for women of all ages and it's like revitalising their sex lives. Um, I find this quite bizarre because the book is essentially just pornography and if women wanted to look at porn, then that's everywhere. And it's, it's true that the book has is because it's now like it's, it's very socially acceptable to read this book and in that respect it has enabled a lot of people to read it, but I like a lot of people to read it who necessarily who might not necessarily have like come into contact with that before 
But I just find it, I just, I really don't know what to say to people when they say to me that this is like feminist or this is liberating because from my perspective, the book really isn't. And um, I really wanted to know how, how, how do I argue with someone and say, and try to kind of get across them that this isn't a liberating book. Not that I'm arguing with like the content of the book that's BDSM and I don't think that's the same thing, but I just wanted to know how do I, co- how do I counteract someone when they're arguing with me and saying to me that this book is liberating when I really don't think that it is. Thank you. Hi, I just wanted to say it's something. The, it's the other one. It's this one. <laughs> I got everything wrong. Um, I just wanted to say something in response to the question about what difference would it make if we get rid of cap- uh, capitalism. I think, as a socialist, my understanding is that the um, sexism is rooted in, is in class society. It is not natural for men to be misogynist any more than it's natural for women to be victims of that misogyny. I, I sort of defy that analysis. And the evidence I think we've got is that it wasn't always like this. We've got evidence of pre-class societies where, yes, that women did have the children sort of by definition, but that wasn't used as an excuse to give them a lesser share of the wealth of that society or a lesser share of the status of that society. It wasn't used as, as an excuse to oppress women, as it always has done under class society. What evidence have we got of this is, um, say for anthropology, this is a wonderful book called The Myth of Male Dominance by Eleanor Laycock. She looks at uh, ancient, uh, different societies, which were not class societies, which were not were sharing societies, equality societies, where there were not there, there were, were divisions of labour between men and women, but they weren't used as a, as a, a repression. There's this wonderful um, article about 16th century Jesuit priests arriving in America from um, early capitalist uh, Europe, and they were shocked and horrored, and they were like, "Gosh, the devil's in charge here," because they were looking at societies where men did not control women, and where sexuality was not oppressed and people did not treat each other in the way that they thought was normal and natural. Um, amongst the uh, hunter-gatherer societies as well, they thought it very strange. You only look after your own children, the children are biologically yours. We look after all our children, and it's not just the women who look after the children. These are, these are the evidence that we've got that our nature is not naturally twisted by the circumstances we live under now. But ca- capitalist society is not the only class society. That equality came to an end in the advent of class society, property and inheritance. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I was really interested in, uh, you know, this idea that it's gone full circle, because I certainly feel like that. I'm having the same arguments with my kids' high school about short skirts. So I certainly thought we'd won an argument about, you know, it doesn't affect how you learn what you wear, actually, and the fact that, you know, one of my kids is wearing a short skirt really shouldn't make her responsible for the idea that maybe there's harassment out there. So I do think we've come full circle about that. But you say, I work in a primary school, and I think, you know, sex is actually quite insidious, isn't it? You know, people don't uh, tend to say you don't have a sense of humour if you walk in and you say, well, actually, you know what? Sleeping Beauty did not kiss the prince. Actually, Sleeping Beauty woke up and said, get off me because I'm going to go have a career. People go, actually, actually, you know, that's quite a reasonable thing to say as a vibrant woman. Do you want to actually tell five-year-olds that their role in life is to lie around passively, going to sleep, with some bloke coming along who they've never met before, you know, telling them what to do. But what I wanted to just finish on, and I think, you know, it can have an impact, actually, making those little comments, because often people don't even think about it. But what I wanted to really talk about was how ideas change. And I'll be very, very quick. In the miners' strike, the first day of the miners' strike, when I went up the picket lines, there were girly calendars, you know, all these naked calendars, and people alternated between going, actually, there's this sexist calendar in there, good, or, oh, you're a woman, would you like our bit of wood dusted off for you to sit down? Now, six months later, we weren't having those sort of arguments because women on the picket lines, women in the soup kitchens, women in the struggle had had arguments as equals and people's ideas change in struggle. I want to see more struggle in this autumn and I think we'll get rid of this bloody stuff. I've just got um, a quick question. Um, I've just finished my first day of uni and was really just shocked and appalled at the uh, levels of sexism that I faced. And this was coming out of a Catholic school and a Catholic college, um, where I really didn't think it could get much worse. Um, (laughs) 
so uh, and this was the last the last day of my first term and as we were going out this guy walks over to me looks me up and down and says seven out of ten and my question is even though I'm not really one for individual politics how do you respond to that situation because I poured my can on his head <laughs> <laughs> But really, it didn't make me feel any better, and all his friends were laughing, and, you know, the, the joke really, well, not the joke, the, the insult was on me, but the thing that most infuriated me was this group of, of young women that came over to me and then said, but why do you do that? A seven's good. <laughs> and again... <laughs> How do I respond to that? And I was trying to explain if they'd given me a 10, I would have done the same, maybe even spat in the face or expelled some other bodily fluid on them. <laughs> and I, I, just, I just want to know that how, how, how am I supposed to do that? I mean, I still said, you know, when she was targeted by a group of 10, just say, fuck off. But how, how, can, how can you push through just in individual settings as well as in a wider context. Thank you, Ken. So I wanted to first of all come back on the question about if we remove capitalism, will it actually change relations between men and women? Because you see, I think sexism, as women's oppression today, is deeply rooted in capitalism and in particular how it's organised around the family. And this is because actually capitalism needs workers. It needs people educated, healthy, can go to work, didn't want to pay for it. So I know what, let's reinforce a family where actually it's seen as women's role to do those jobs, to actually have children, bring them up, make sure they're healthy so that actually we can have people who go to work and do those jobs. But you see, we do have a glimpse of absolutely when we got rid of that. We're here at Marxism, we celebrate actually Marxist history, the high point of actually our history was the Russian Revolution, where actually a different vision was put out there, where actually relations changed. This is a very backward country, we've heard some terrible instances of sexism in the descriptions. I'll tell you what, sexism has been rife in Russia before 1917. You know, men were allowed to have a whip on their bed to keep their wife in line. But what did they do? Because men and women made that revolution together. Actually things like collectivised childcare. So it wasn't all done in the home. Actually do things like providing canteens so women didn't have to stay in cook so they could be politically engaged. It was a real different vision of a different state of how we could run it. And I just want to finish on because sometimes that can seem a long way away. And sexism that we're facing, women's oppression today, seems so entrenched. How are we going to challenge that? And part of it wasn't just they went from one society in Russia to another. It's because people, when they fought, they actually transformed themselves and how they saw each other. But think about what that means today. You see, I think back to two years ago when students were on the streets fighting over EMA, fighting against the privatisation of education, having to pay more, and it was young men and women inspiring us all. But I bet the men on that demo, probably some of them did hold some crazy ideas from society, but I bet they weren't looking at the women thinking seven out of ten or whatever. They were looking at women kicking down the police vans as the photos showed them linking arms against the police, fighting together. And actually, that's an opportunity for us to see each other very differently, not in terms of how capitalism commodities and makes us set against each other and judge each other by what we look. But actually, as people have got a shared interest in bringing this down. And when we're heading into the autumn, you think there's going to be more student demos that's going to bring together many people. There's going to be strikes that bring together maybe a million people. A demo by the, called by the TUC. All this will bring women and men together with lots of ideas. But they will have a shared interest in getting rid of the people at the top who actually gain from us being divided and do this on purpose. And that's why we've got to go out and build those. But you challenge all those crap ideas in the midst to fighting together in that way. I feel left out like I don't have a book, but, you know. Um, <laughs> um, I, I'll just touch on sort of a couple of the things that um, sort of you raised. I think what was really interesting and, um, you know, I think if we were sort of talking about this all day, which I frequently do, I would have definitely touched on some of your points around sort of femininity. And I think it's really interesting sort of particularly... Um, in terms of employment, actually, when you look at kind of all levels of things, so I think we like to think that sometimes 
because um, in employment are very black and white, so it's you know the way people behave in an office or whatever, as opposed to just the roles people do. But if you look even at something like apprenticeships, um, nearly 100%, I think it's something like 98% of people on childcare apprenticeships are women, and the number pretty much flips around for engineering apprentices. Also, childcare is the lowest paid apprenticeship, and engineering is the highest paid apprenticeship. So that is an incredibly sort of real sort of thing of, you know, the idea of these, you know, very false, very, very constructed and actually almost becoming more than more visible differences between um, genders are sort of um, seen there. And also, I think, you know, when we look at who sort of certainly change makers are and who people are, I think when we say leaders, I don't just mean sort of elected leaders, I don't just mean the people who are in charge of things, I mean people who often self-appoint as leaders and people talk about often problems in their students' unions, in their activist groups, who are the first people who get up and speak often. They're glad to see it's a very, very mixed year today, which I think is excellent, because it's certainly not always the case at these um, sort of events. Um, it, because, actually, traits that are seen as masculine are seen as very positive traits, unless women have them, in which case they're seen as very bad. I'm consistently called aggressive, and whilst I am quite aggressive, um, men who sort of have similar traits, have a similar speaking style to me, because I've got, I've actually got quite a sort of unquote, male speaking style, it's very, sort of very sort of big arms, I'm like, sort of like this, it's like I'm doing a dance, I'm not, um, but that's, that's frowned upon in women, and it's actually about some, challenging some of those things that are often very internal, or, you know, when you hear someone go, God, she's such a bitch, but, you know, isn't he strong and tough, that's very much... You know, those kind of things. And they have a real impact on what people go on to do, what perceptions are, and um, whether that's the, I think, the one people always talk about is um, primary school teachers. The majority of primary school teachers are women. There's still the majority of primary school head teachers are men. And, you know, it's these kind of ideas. And think about um, when you go into a room, next time you're at a restaurant, people continually um, go up for the family meal, give my father the bill. He earns a lot less money than my mother. So they should probably, they don't get a tip. Um, that's how it works, the service industry. But um, just it sort of, actually, I think I'll lead on in terms of that, um, what a um, woman said about what do you do on a kind of one-to-one -one level when someone says something to you. And actually, it's those ideas around masculinity and femininity, why I might react differently, because people will not say certain things to me. Because when you sort of walk around, sort of broad-shouldered, short hair, covered in tattoos, and people tend to sort of leave you alone, which is <laughs> sort of quite nice. But... Um, on sort of actually on a really practical level, particularly within universities, and I think this touches on some things about schools as well, you, what you have to do is, it's not always about the there and then, and actually sometimes just leave that because that person is not the person to engage with. It's about kicking up that fuss, and particularly in universities, because, there's, because universities sort of thrive on, and it's very unfortunate, they thrive on a public image. Now, when, that, when you write the blog that says, my university will not do anything about sexism, here are the letters I've sent the Vice-Chancellor and they've refused to reply. When you hold that rally of you know, 50 women and then the next time it's 100 women, because actually if you speak to women on your campus, you don't necessarily go up to them with a, let's fight against sexism, you go, isn't it a bit shit when X, Y and Z happens? And then maybe you have some of the discussions afterwards and say, why won't people do things about it? That's when they start to listen, and it's very sad that that's the way things are. But actually, often when we're talking to people who run universities, who run schools, they are people who are benefiting from a society where men believe it's acceptable to behave like that to women. Because when you look at sort of the stale, pale male vice-chancellors of this country, I think if women had equality, pretty much most of them wouldn't be in their jobs. So they really benefit from a society that values, you know, middle-class white men, and they don't want to challenge it, so you have to embarrass them into doing it. And I've always really wanted to sort of throw a drink over someone, so I'm really quite envious. <laughs> um, I think it's watching too many sort of soap operas, you know, glass of wine in the face. But what I think a thing to sort of take away is, for every sort of bad story, and for everything people have said, um, actually they tend to have ended with that and then I did this about it or actually no I'm here today talking about it and I think it's sort of a duty as actually as activists to enable everybody who experiences something like that well actually we want to stop the experience but we want them to be able to have that end point say well actually well, I, I was furious about this so I went away and I did x y and z 
and actually the sort of working together because you'll never do it by yourself you'll try as you might you can write your letters of complaint you can start your petition whatever but actually experiences aren't unique yes they're different but they're not completely unique and it's only by sort of working together and looking at a far sort of broader picture of things you know everything and sort of taking that out of it because I'm sure you'll have many discussions this weekend, but you know, sort of the next time someone says something, does something, turn around and have a chat. Um, I'm, I'm a great believer in sort of intervention in public spaces. Um, I go up and I tell people off um, for things. So, group of you know young men who are catcalling people, I go over and shout at them. Um, I mean, whilst my behaviours are probably not things everyone should sort of follow, just having those even conversations in day-to-day life and talking to people and saying, actually, you know, here are some things you can do. Things it doesn't always have to be planning for that massive end point. It's actually about creating real sort of links with everybody. There's actually people who experience the same things, opening eyes and then talking about the kind of bigger political picture. That's certainly the thing I've always tried to do, and I think it's gone all right sometimes. But... um, I just I think that's sort of what I take out of it. And also, I do think so, something else, Fifty Shades of Grey seems really weird, and the fact that it is always being discussed on Radio 4 is actually terrifying. It's really putting me off public service broadcasting. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, cheers, that was really, um, it's been a really great uh, discussion and a meeting and I think also probably quite shocking to hear the young women speaking about uh, their experience and what it's like because I'm sure for some of us who have fought for years, I see in front of me um, Jo here who was one of the women who went to Miss World, the original Miss World and completely disrupted that, you know, you must look at this and think, you know, <laughs> Oh, don't worry, I'll have to not be able to Will read. Will these be any good? They might be. Actually, is are those? Oh, there they are, yeah. I haven't got my glasses on to find my glasses. Right. Um, but I think that idea that, you know, we're still talking about these things, and in many ways, the irony is we're talking about it in a cruder... Some of the stuff that's happening to women is cruder and harsher today, ironically because we're more open, which is a good thing. We're more open about sex. That's a good thing. It's acknowledged that women have their own sexual desires. That's a good thing. But actually, because capitalism remained, we didn't get rid of capitalism. We made lots of changes and we made lots of gains. The system's still there. So therefore, sexual liberation is, 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 um, has been distorted by the fact that it's in a system that's run for profit and everything becomes a commodity. And actually, our liberation has also now become a commodity. It's become raunch culture. It's become something to buy and sell. It's become something that is lap dancing. It's pole dancing for exercise. Don't see any men getting exercise by swinging round a pole in high heels. But, you know, but therefore, therefore, that idea that actually the only way to show how hip you are, how, in, you know, how open you are, how free you are of all the things that hold you back, how liberated you are, is to be into porn, is to, to pole dance, is a sign of how distorted and how capitalists can distort even something that should be, you know, which is part of our humanity, to, be, um, to have sexual relationships that are not just about procreation. You know, that is part of being a human, and yet now it's turned into something that is, um, that is something that can be bought and sold or stolen and in something that has become, has become a horrible commodity. And I think that that whole um, thing that people describe, um, you know, uh, about school and about college. I mean, the fact that universities, you know, the fact that the woman who said that universities actually more sexist sort of culture than being at a Catholic school and stuff is just, you know, really shocking. The places where people should come and feel able to learn and debate and be open and confident is a place where people are suffering. This is something absolutely appalling. And I think this needs organisation. You know, it isn't. I mean, I think the woman who responded by chucking the drink, perfect, you know, absolutely. But in the long run, you can't chuck drink over everybody. And it's still the culture that created the the idea that the bloke could feel he could do that still remains, doesn't it? And therefore, you know, we have to have um, networks and organisations of people that change the culture on campus, that makes this sort of thing unacceptable. And this is what's happened in certain places where there has been sometimes sexual assaults and attacks on women or language being used or whatever, is that actually you fight 
women and men who say it's unacceptable, that this isn't how we want to live, this isn't what we want our university to be like. And that's what we're going to have to do. We have to make the dominant culture one that is anti-sex, a dominant culture, one that says that everybody should have the right to be here without fear of how they're going to be treated, how they're going to be uh, talked about. And that's in the long run, and not even the long run, I'm not talking years waiting for a revolution, I'm talking about this can be turned around if we get organised. And there are more of us. Maybe there's people that don't speak out because nobody else has spoken out. But if a few of you get together and say we're not going to put up with this then actually you can have a sense of how the thing can be can be turned around and I think in terms of school um, and the idea that rape has become something that um, sometimes even young women don't identify it as that or becomes acceptable. I mean, I think this is totally goes back to what somebody said in the discussion about well, how, and I think Estelle said it too, how young men are socialised to think this is what being a young man is. This is how you get sex, to actually take it from somebody because you don't actually think anybody really want to have sex with you. So you've got to force a woman to do it or get her so drunk she doesn't know she's doing it. And that, again, it shows how distorted, you know, a sense of what being a young young man is that this is actually the way to get some sort of positive feedback from your mates and everything else and so therefore the, the whole thing is rotten to the core of what it does to our humanity and I think therefore I mean and it isn't just at school I mean people may have seen that thing about that um, I've written about it in the thing in the, um, the latest journal where that bloke the footballer a number of footballers you know who've been done for rape and sexual assault a culture amongst footballers you know there's a thing called um, harvesting in Manchester, where footballers, um, premier footballers, send round people, rep reps, to, to basically chat up women, and chat up means, do you want to come to a club tonight and meet a footballer? You know, it's not like chat up courting, you know. It's like, come and have sex with a footballer tonight. And so women are basically brought to these clubs and taken off by the footballers who just think, well, they earn millions of pounds every week, you know, a woman's going to want to sleep with them. And if they don't, they force it. And this guy has been done for rape and is in prison, but there was a gap, there was a, some of the football fans wanted to do a tribute to him in the match, the next match he wasn't there. His girlfriend has posted stuff on Twitter going, oh, can't, you know, I'm going to stand by him and everything else. So this idea that it can become something that's actually, you know, not just okay amongst blokes, but okay also amongst women is something that just shows how deep this goes and how we have to take it on as a, jet, as a whole culture that represents something that's going on. I mean, also, look at the ruling class. This isn't just happening amongst, you know, in, in, in schools and in colleges. Look at strauss Kahn. You know, look at what happened, you know, to that woman who had the courage to come forward in that hotel and to say what had happened to her. And he is still, you know, OK, he didn't get to be the next president of, uh, of France, thankfully, but he's still being regarded as somebody, oh, maybe wrong's been done by him. And yet women are coming out more and more saying what he has done and other men like, uh, like him have done. You know, and look at that guy only done for rape, the leader of the fox hunts fox hounds somewhere, you know, one of these hunt leaders who's done for rape. He said, oh, but she wanted it. You know, that idea that this can be twisted around constantly in, uh, in society to say that this is, uh, this, these are normal sexual relations, if you like, is something that shows how far, how far it's gone. As for Fifty Shades of Grey, I haven't looked at the book yet. Uh, I have to say that I think the bits that I've read of it that I've seen, I mean, it's not just about, is this liberating? Is this even good fiction? You know, um, <laughs> is this something you'd even want to read? I think if this is really what sexual liberation is, this book, well, I'm sorry, there is a long way to go, isn't there? Um, and I think that sense, I mean, I think there's almost a theory about it. I think, you know, people are saying, oh, it's the, the highest selling paperback in history. That's just simply not true. I'm not saying it may not become true because there's such a curiosity about a thing and it's become, oh, everybody's got to read what everybody's reading. But, you know, let's not get carried away. This has become some a media thing and suddenly it becomes an acceptable thing to read, whereas maybe you wouldn't have done before. It's written by a woman. And actually it shows the dearth of the ability of expression, of openness about sex and everything else that people feel that they can discuss that isn't representing and distorted relations and everything else. And the whole sense of, um, of the limited way that we can express um, sexual liberation within a system that commodifies us and our bodies, I think is quite hard. And that's why we also have to look, while we challenge sexism, and we're anti this and anti that and stop this, is we also have to think about what the other side, how we could live, how it could be different. Because if we don't do that, then we're constantly just fighting against things and not fighting for something. And that's why the question of what would it be like without capitalism is a really important one. What would it be like? And I agree with the, um, the woman who said, actually, if the way that we live at the moment isn't the only way we have to live. In fact, humans have only lived this way for a tiny fraction of human history. And so therefore, it isn't natural the way we live in the idea that a nuclear family is totally responsible for the next generation and everything else. In a different society, I mean, the way that socialism is sometimes put across sounds really awful. It's often put across that we're all going to be the same. 
you know, we'll all be, you know, wearing the same clothes. We'll have to share great vats of gruel. We'll all be, you know, living in these homes with no... Ch this is what society's like today. We've got no choice. We're all wearing the same clothes. We're all living in the same little boxes. We all have to live... This is what capitalism is like. Real choice about different ways to live. That you don't biologically have to have children, but you may love kids and want to work with them and look after some of these kids. You may want to have children, but you may not want them every minute of your life. There will be different ways to live. Nobody will be forced to collectivise like Stalin did in Russia. Nobody will be forced to live in any way. And only, I think, when we've been through the process of revolutionary change, will we all think outside the box as well? Because we are conditioned by our own, we're broken out of it. We're at Marxism, we're talking about socialism, we're talking about women's liberation. So we're challenging the ideas, we're not just empty vessels, but at the same time to actually envisage somewhere where actually for somebody to make a sexual comment about you or to mark you out of ten would be something, you know, that nobody would even dream of doing that. And therefore that's what I think we've got to, to think about, because I think it was right what, um, what um, Estelle said about the ruling class. They have a sense of entitlement, don't they? They think they're going to rule forever. Cameron was born to rule. It's like these Bullington boys, public school. You know, they thought that they were going to rule, and they are. And we can't let them get away with the sense that they could just take it for granted we're going to take this shit all the time. And I think the fact that the scandals that come out one after another about the bankers, about the media, and Murdoch, and everything else, each time this comes about, it lifts another layer, doesn't it, of exposing the real nature of our society. There's nothing natural about this, there's nothing right about this, it distorts all our lives. And what is good, on the one hand we've got a horrible crisis, we've got a rotten, horrible Tory government, but we've also got something else, haven't we? We've got the struggle from below, and it does make a difference. It made a difference, I think, even the 26th of March last year to see that demonstration at the TUC. Millions of people around the country would have looked at that and thought, wow, the working class is still here, and there's loads of women, and this is what the working class looks like. The unions just didn't disappear in the 80s, but actually we have got the possibility of fighting back. And I think, therefore, my final point is this, is actually when we talk about another sort of society, about socialism, I don't believe you can have socialism without women's liberation. Because if women are still oppressed, it's not yet socialism. You need to keep fighting. But I don't believe we're going to win women's liberation under capitalism. I don't think it's an essential part of capitalism. It grew up a class society long before capitalism. But I don't believe capitalism can deliver women's liberation within the structures it is at the moment. It can't even deliver food to every human on this planet, even though there's more than enough food for everybody on this planet. So how is it going to get liberation? So we have to fight the two things together. Fight every expression of women's oppression and racism and homophobia and everything else, while at the same time saying that our class has got the power to do something much more, and that is to create a very different sort of society. And I think all of you here, I mean, I think it's been a tremendous meeting. It shows how much we've got to fight for. And before the meeting started, SL said to me, I was talking to her about Marxism and how many were here, and she says, do you get many people sort of sign up to the SWP here? And so I said, oh, we, we get a few. I hope we get a few tonight, because I want you, everybody in here, to join in this struggle, to join in this battle, because it's... We talk about it being the fight of our lives, and some people say it easily and just off the top of their heads. But this is the fight for our lives, because actually capitalists will only get out of this crisis if they make us pay. And if that is often also working class women, but working class in general, that's the only way they'll get out of it. Let's make sure this time they do not get out of this crisis by making us pay. We get out of this crisis by getting rid of them. Yeah.